shadowing us right behind us, right on the side of us. You could, you could kind of see the thing moving through the woods. Uh, all I can remember is flipping the light on, and I see this creature, and I knew, I knew in my heart, I knew in my mind, in the whole night, this isn't a man. And then this thing walks across the road, takes a turn towards us, and then leaps over a guardrail. Went to look forward, and there was a big black thing, is all I can call it. To Squatch D TV, exploring the Bigfoot mystery each week with your hosts, veteran researcher, author, and TV personality, the Squatch Detective Steve Culls, and from the Bigfoot Research Project of Kentucky, Chris Bennett. Sit back and buckle up as we bring you guests from around North America discussing the Bigfoot phenomena, but not without a few laughs too. Here are your hosts, Steve and Chris. And good evening, cyberspace. Welcome to Squatch DTV for today's date, May 9th, 2021. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. And all the mothers in heaven, happy Mother's Day, guys. And uh, I'm your host, your guide, the Squatch Detective, Steve Coles. Well... I'm flying solo tonight because Chris is off this week. Got a little bit of a back problem. How long has he had it? Well, about a week back. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I'm kind of, uh, it's just me and Mr. Steenberg tonight. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing fine, sir. I'm doing fine. And well, I didn't forget to phone my mother this morning. So. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> Good man, my you know I I tried, but you know the long distance bill would have killed me because he's mm. upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, like, uh, as we we normally do, let's do the shout outs for this week. I see B Lynn in our chat room. Hello, B. Hello, eyes see an enigma. He's back again. Welcome back. Um. Good to see you, Ammon Chris. Hello, Ammon. Good to see you, John Swan. Good to see you, my brother, Aaron Mollenkamp. Camp, good to see you. We got the Western New York Bigfoot Organization. Ah, there he is. Uh, he said he tried to get in early, so he wasn't in the nosebleed seats. So, <laughs> and of course, we got Christy London in. Hello, we're uh, we were trying to get Mike to come on. I think he's having a little transmission issues, and Mike was going to be the backup co-host tonight. And uh, nope. And of course, we got a uh, here's new uh, Arthur. Welcome, Arthur. Lockbeard, welcome to the show. Good to see you. I know you. I, I think we saw you over at uh, Squatch Talk a couple of weeks ago. Welcome to Squatch DTV. Kenneth Collins, welcome, Ken. It's been a, been a bit. Glad to see you back. Uh, who else? Oh, Brian and Chewy go hiking. Hello, Brian. Good to see you. Uh, Frank Smith from the UK. Hello, Frank. Good to see you. I hope things are okay over the pond. And I hope you guys are getting through your COVID dilemma soon. Bob Lemley is in the house. There he is. Hello, Bob. Jimmy Trick. Good to see you, sir. 
And of course, we got my my good friend. Uh, where oh, we we got Rick uh, from <laughs> from Mineral Point, Wisconsin. Hello, hello. And um, who else we got? We got uh, I saw Mackie James in there somewhere, and my my good buddy uh, Austin. So we will uh, let's start the show. So um, you know, let's let's hop to it since. We have nothing to jib jab about. Usually, Chris and I will banter about something silly. And we got Diane in the house who's yelling hi at Christy. <laughs> Welcome, Diane. Um, and uh, I'm and Chris is asking because we, we talked about that earlier before the show. Is Bigfoot going to call in? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, Bigfoot can call in, but we don't have Igor or Igor or whatever you want to call him. We don't have him on the show to interpret. So <laughs> it would just be babble. Um, of course, we got Jerry's in the house. Hello, hello, and uh, Nikki is in the house as well. Hello, Nikki. And uh, what's up? Besides my blood pressure and my cholesterol, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and of course, Charlie Wonton in the house. We haven't seen Charlie in a couple of weeks. There he is. So, but anyway, Tom, we, we last time we had you on, we we got in this big discussion about the uh, the the massacre debate. And uh, we can put that behind us since that was many months ago. And I want to get into you. I, I want to get into how you got started into the Bigfoot business and and some of your your you, you've been on a lot of different exploits. It looks, you know, amazing. And I want to talk, especially like the to me, the Jacko stuff you did was just amazing because you brought that 1800, 1800 newspaper story to life on your videos. So that was really cool too. So, um, so anyway, um, how did you get started in this? I was a weird kid growing up. I was a weird, weird kid growing up, uh, you know, growing up in the 1960s. And of course, back then, the only guys who were really doing much in this whole Sasquatch question was, you know, the late John Green, the late Reddy DeHendon and people like that. And it all started for me one day when uh, my parents, I think it was like 1965 or something like that, 1966. For me and my sister brought home for, you know, education purposes, a hardcover Reader's Digest book. And in that book, you know, it had paragraphs and chapters on anything you could think of from volcanoes to hurricanes to tornadoes to nature to this to that and of course it had a big section in the middle of the book on on the age of the dinosaurs with those beautiful color paintings in there which the you know most uh, uh dinosaur experts say were wrong you know they told us brontosaurus was so heavy he had to spend all this time in the water <laughs> yeah. t-rex standing straight up dragging his tail on the ground and uh court painting tall just know none of that is true now and uh and right in the middle of that dinosaur section there was a little two-page article with the usual three blurry black and white pictures called the thing in loch ness I don't know something some switch and uh, uh and of course the term cryptozoology wasn't really used all that much but something snapped and i must have read that damn thing 80 times <laughs> and i started pestering my parents for more information they eventually got me a library card because again there were no computers or anything like that if you want to learn something you had to yep. read about it in books Amazing so, that. <laughs> yeah so i had to go down and trying to find more on this so-called Loch Ness monster i started reading about this thing in western canada called the sasquatch and the united states they called it bigfoot and i got and i knew at a very young age i was never going to move to scotland so <laughs> but i think what really did was not too long after that uh on a school night when i should have been in bed i came downstairs and my parents were watching uh, a movie uh, uh, on the black and white tv in the living room and you know i walked around the corner and i expected the the usual from my father hey boy it's a school night what are you doing i'm coming back on there you know, that guy. <laughs> but he didn't and uh, as i recall his words were around something like hey the lad's interested in this sort of thing maybe we ought to let him watch this and my mother gave the oh no he can't watch this oh bad dream you know that kind of thing Okay, my and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But my father won the argument. I was allowed to watch whatever they were watching. I'm sure he's regretted that victory ever since. And what was playing was that old 
Hammer horror film, The Abominable Snowman in the Himalayas, and it was Sasquatch from that day on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look who uh look who decided to show up. We got Mike. Mike Ann is gonna be our special guest co-host, deep in the woods, as you can see. Oh hey, Mike. <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you doing? How are you guys all doing tonight? We Good. are wonderful. We're glad you could make it. I knew you had to get in position probably somewhere to get a signal. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and it's uh for May in western New York, where it was like 60 yesterday. Uh, we're looking at about, I don't know, quarter inch of snow on the road right now. <laughs> sure you aren't in Canada? Uh, well, you know, we are Western New York. It's only an hour and a half to the fall. So, yeah, we could be. All right. There we go. So that, that's easy. So <clears throat> so tell, tell me, you know, how did you start your research? I mean, aside from, I mean, reading and, you know, I, when, you know, you kind of made me laugh when you talked about going to a library because I wonder if kids even know what those old card catalogs were or the, yeah. or the index, the, the library indexing system. Was that the Dewey index system? I forget what they called it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, I remember going to school and they taught you how libraries index books. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was strange. And, of course, most of the books and what I was interested in was usually stuffed in with stuff on ghosts and all kinds of other things because you could tell they, they didn't treat it as a serious subject. But what, what really got me going is when I was in my early years, uh, I was just completed in the late 70s when I was posted to Alberta when, when I was doing my time in the Army, Canadian Army, 1st Battalion, PBCLI. I saw the Rocky Mountains for the first time in my life one morning coming out of the base because we got bust in the tour of the Regimental Museum. And uh, and uh, I looked at them, and it looked like a phony. It was a beautiful, clear winter's day, and they have what they call a Chinook, where the, it was perfectly clear. And the Rocky Mountains were right there before me. I had never seen them before in my life. And it looked like a phony Hollywood backdrop. You know, it was that clear. I must have stood there for like 20 minutes just staring at him. And I thought, and I made two decisions. I said, one, I'm never going to live anywhere east of this line ever again. And two, if they've been seen in Western British Columbia or in Eastern British Columbia, they have to be seen here too. So what I did is I, I took out an ad in the Southern Alberta Press at the time. And the ad was quite simple. Sasquatch, anyone who believes they've had a sign of this creature, please contact Thomas Steamer with a phone number. And I never really expected much of a result. But I tell you, my phone was almost ringing on a daily basis. Hmm, now, and this wasn't too far from the old dairy farm where Ray DeHinnon got his start 20 years before me. You know, right in, the, right in that beautiful view of the Rocky Mountains and Calgary oh, – west of calgary alberta uh and i got contacted by the late professor vladimir mccotic if you remember that name i do not I yeah he was a that. he was a professor of anthropology and archaeology at the university of calgary and he he co-authored and put together that book with the late grover Krant, sasquatch and other unknown hominids okay right and that's true and and Vladimir, I mean, introduced and Vladimir was a senior citizen even back then, and he couldn't get around much anymore. So basically, we, we kind of became unofficial partners. He did the academic stuff, and I went out and did the, the field investigations, and we, we co-opted. And uh, he wrote the forward for, for my first book, which came out in 89, The Sasquatch in Alberta. And, uh, and through Vladimir and, and time, I, I met the late John Green. I met the late Bob Timmis. I met the late Grover Krantz. I met the late Rennie Danden. And I got to know all these gentlemen very well, became friends with them all, managed to do research with them all. And I was fortunate enough never, ever, like so many others, to get sucked into their personal wars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There were so many uh, people who... Uh, if Rennie, if uh, Dip, Rennie found out he was seen uh, uh, working with Titmus, Rennie wouldn't have anything to do with them, and vice versa. Huh? But for some reason, they never held it against me. I don't know why. Rennie would always go. Rennie would always say things like, well, "What does that Titmus say about this or that?" <laughs> yeah, 
And I just simply tell him, I'm not going to tell you, Rene. I won't tell him what you said. And I won't tell you what he said. He didn't like it, but he never held it against me. And I still to this day wonder why, but it did. It, 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 it worked out though, and that's how I got started. Wow, and, and that's that's a great start having a partner, you know, a, a, that that is actually a scientist. Yes, yes, and he was one of the few. Him and the late Grover Kratz at the time were one of the few. Uh, never really met John Napier. He, he had passed away before then, and uh, and uh, and boy, did they ever get a lot of heat from their fellow academics back then for even having an interest in this kind of sure. thing. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. That's um, what my- that's why my driver tonight's anonymous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> His driver is a scientist. <laughs> we'll leave it at yeah. that. It's, it's a, I guess they're getting not as much heat today, but they sure did back then. It was like a taboo subject. You know, the, in, in Britain, there was always a bad term in, in, in the halls of, of academia and science, the road to Loch Ness, and it was not a good road to be on if you were – a young professor trying to get a, make your your mark in the world of uh, anthropology or zoology or whatever it happened to be. You know, we you know we 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 Mike, we could put him on if he just puts his mask up and his hat down, and we can call him, you know, Doctor Elvin Dorwinkle. You know, we can, we can call him. A, <laughs> well, yes, Doctor Dorwinkle. On that side of the truck. So, yeah. he's what does Doctor Dorwinkle teach? Yes, I teach home economics, and uh, we teach how to bake cakes. And no, no, <laughs> there's a lot of chemistry involved with baking, as you all know. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anywho, uh, so okay, so let's let's take a little diversion here because you knew, you know, three of the four horsemen Mm -hmm. and um if you could sum up maybe in one sentence uh i'll just go down the list john green strictly zoological gentleman and uh common sense to the hilt uh grover krantz a brilliant uh scientist open-minded and not afraid to take the crap and we will allow you to say more than one sentence about rennie de hinden Rene was Rene. There's no other way to describe it. <laughs> I'll never forget his his comment about uh, Kiwani lapsaritis. <laughs> <laughs> He's had 267 sightings in his mind. It's like saying you've had sex so, like 267 times but never got laid. <laughs> it was actually... He's had so much whatever encounters. That's like saying you've had 260 sexual encounters but never got laid. <laughs> <laughs> you know the quote. <clears throat> oh, my God. And, uh, and just so you all know, Mick the Meatloaf, si- uh, yeah, Siphon is in the house. And Jordy, Jordy Warner is in the house. Hello, Jordan. And Nani is here as well. Want to make sure we throw out. And of course, Central Florida Bigfoot is in the house as well. Welcome one, welcome all. Um that 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 is great. Now, is it true? You know, I know Renee really ha- was at odds with Grover, was at odds with John, was at odds with Peter Byrne. Obviously, I think everybody was odd, at odds with Peter Byrne. <laughs> um uh was I mean, how did John and Grover get along? You know? Oh, very, very well. They're yeah. very good friends. They got along very, very well. And uh, Rene, he, he, he just thought that, and I was a little, at first I was a little bit more on Grover's side than that because it, what, what caused him to sour on Grover was Grover's support for the late Paul Freeman and his mind. Yeah. You see, because as far as Rene was concerned, it was all nonsense. Yeah. I had to do it. I had to admit at first that I thought Paul Freeman and his initial encounter in 1982 when he was a watershed ranger was authentic. Mm. And I defended him a lot longer. I knew Paul Freeman. Um, uh, As a human being, you couldn't ask for an actual guy. If the world were filled with Paul Freeman, the world would be a better place. But for some reason on this subject, and um, I'm only expressing my opinion, uh, Ivan Mark syndrome. 
Gotcha. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now, so you, you, you think the Freeman film is not authentic? In, in my opinion, it isn't. And which okay. film are you talking about? He took two. The uh, the the one where uh, the famous one where you say, there "Oh, there goes." Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can't really back this up. But in my opinion, I think it's his son Dwayne in a suit because Dwayne's a real big man, like Paul is. Gotcha. In my opinion, and I think it's the same suit they tried to use once before, and as well as several still photographs in years before that as well. Yeah, and Dwayne's a hell of a nice guy too. But for some reason, he was just helping his fa father out and making up a lot of stuff. And when I call it Ivan Marx syndrome, Ivan Marx, if you know, you know, remember who that was, he was a guy back who was really heavily involved in the '60s and '70s. Came to prominence during the Bosberg Cripple incidents in 1969-70, and Ivan Marx, um, it's like I said was probably involved in, in that and he was kind of like um later on he started faking films and making up stories he was a generally a yarn spinner yep and 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 i i call ivan mark syndrome because that's a guy who's a researcher who may have been involved in something authentic once it's the center of attention for a while and when that attention dies down uh, the attention apparently was more important than the subject. So they start making stuff up to remain the set of retention. And it works until they get caught. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Now, now see, I always, I always had an air of suspicion about the Bosberg track. Yeah. Because it was Ivan Marks that found it. Yeah. Well, actually, um, Renny always told me, I always asked him, do you feel that Ivan, because he was mm -hmm. with Ivan. Yes. You know, yep. That line of tracks you're looking at, that he said, he goes, no, it was me who said, let's go look down there. Now, okay. maybe, maybe I just picked the right way and he had it up. I don't know. But he said, I found them. Yep. And I told Ivan, Ivan was looking on the other side of the road. I called him over. Okay. And, because yeah. according to, to his book, uh, the uh, written with him and Don Hunter, mm -hmm. Uh, it was Marks that pulled over and jumped out of the car and said, I'm going to check this area. Mm -hmm. That then, area. But yeah, Rennie yeah. went down the road and uh, and took another look. Okay. And that's where he found the tracks, right across a fence, right by a railway line. Okay. Yeah. And he, that's why he always felt. And there was variance in them, too. You don't see that because you always see the same right. two two castings that Rene actually poured. But there were actually castings in the cripple foot, the deformed one. There are other castings where you see the toes in different positions and stuff like that. It was a really interesting find. Maybe it was, because even Ivan then, at the time when all that was starting to sell down, he claimed to have shot a film of the crippled creature, which is obvious fake. Yep. Right? And that got exposed. So I, yep. I so because he was the first example of that I call it, I call the whole thing whenever anyone goes off in that direction, I call it Ivan Mark syndrome. <laughs> and of course, oh, we got uh, somebody new in in the uh, chat. I just want to throw a hello out to Blue Daxi. Welcome, welcome to the show. And we also got Terry in the house too. And Terry has a question: How do you feel about the PG film? Of course, I'm pretty sure I know how you feel about it. But go right ahead. In my opinion, in October 20, 1967, if the Sasquatch does indeed exist, and I do believe it does, I believe. Uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gillen filmed one that day. There you have it. Yep. Um, Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? If you'd like to. Sure. I'm, I've no, I know Bob Gillen. He's, uh, we're good friends. I've known him for 30 years, and I just cannot believe he's been lying to my face for 30 years. Yeah. Roger Patterson, I never met. He died of Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1972. Uh, but what I've learned of him in the Yakima area um, you guys remember an old show on television called Green Acres? Sure do. Dun -dun 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 well, there was a character in that show called Mr. Haney, and Roger kind of reminds me of that guy. Everybody in town knew him. Most people really liked him, but everybody also knew, for God's sake, don't lend him any money because you'll never get it back. <laughs> that was Roger Patterson. And, and Roger became involved in the Sasquatch phenomena just a couple of years before he got the film. And the year before, he published his book, Do a Bottom of Stone Man in North America Really Exist, which was a self-published book. And he tried to uh, start his own sort of like Bigfoot group 
at the time. And uh, and they said it was awful funny. People were sending in money, and 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 you see Roger opening up, taking the cash, throwing the applications for his group in the trash can next to him. That that was that was Roger Patterson. And he went to the. Uh, the Shepherd's Camera Shop in Yakima when he was going up to Mount St. Helens with Bob and he rented There it is. This guy. You know, a Cine Kodak K100, Springwell movie camera. You can see that all right. This is the same type of camera that Roger Barrison used. That. Hang on, we're going to... Uh, why don't you hold that bad boy up again? Uh, yeah. Once, let me see if I can't get... Oh. I, I still haven't figured out how to... Um, Click on him and drag it over, Steve, and it, it uh, should drag. Should be able to drag his screen. Uh, Tom's screen. There, we there go. you go. There you go. Yeah, hang up. Uh, this is the other side. She's like, mm -hmm. keep moving the wrong way. It's spring wound, eh? Spring wound movie cam. You got the dial, you got the trigger, and you got the handle here, and you spring wind this thing. The cake took 100 rolls, 100 foot rolls, right? This camera was actually dis this type of camera was actually discontinued in 1964. But there's still a lot of them around, right? And you have this little trigger here. You push down or up to get it to go. You push down. Can you hear it going? Yep. Yeah. Yep. But you let go of it, and it stops automatically. And twice during the sequence that Roger was filming, he stopped filming. And that's why you get two frames that are, are terribly overexposed. And if you look at the dial of this thing, the dials have... Oh, 14 frames per second, uh, 64 frames per second on it, 48 frames per second, uh, 57 frames per second, and 24. There's no 18 frames per second on the dial. But what a lot of people don't know is a lot of these cameras in the early 1960s, were they, they messed around with the inner workings to have them shoot at 18 frames per second, but they never bothered to change any of the dials. Gotcha. So they didn't know. And of course, Roger being Roger, he just rented the camera. He knew he was shown how to how to load it, how to look through it, and how to pull the trick. So he never knew what he had the dial set at. <laughs> he never knew the key information as to what type of lens he had on it. Right. Have, have we ever figured out what type of lens it was? Well, this kind of this lens. It's probably the standard. You know, I can't see it in the light very well here. So you had that camera how long? And you don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> but they were removable and interchangeable. But in this type, you had to unscrew it, take it out, and put another one on. Later on, they came out with the, you know, the turret with the different lenses on it. But Roger had one of these fixed yeah. lens. Now, according to Mick... Uh, Mick uh, Sion said that uh, Roger also had two different lenses. Is that do you know that to be true or not? Or I have no idea if that's true or not. Uh, as far as I know, Roger was just rented the camera. He took it, failed to return it. They issued a warrant for his arrest, <laughs> and he eventually had to give it back. That's because he rented it for this little trip up in the Mount St. Helens region with Bob. And when he got back, he had a message from John Green about the tracks being found in the Blue Creek Mountain region. Uh, that investigation went on in 60, uh, late August, early September. So he rushed down there because at the time, Roger was going to film his own little homemade documentary. He thought he could do that. And he wanted to get pictures of tracks. You know, I'm, I'm sure he hoped. Yep. And I don't know if you can see that, but Central Florida Bigfoot stated, it sounds like your typical Bigfoot researcher not knowing their gear. <laughs> yeah. He was basically just renting a camera, and he knew how to load it, aim it, and shoot, and that's about it. Yeah. And that, and that morning, they went off going back to an area they'd already been through three times before. Roger always felt that, uh, and, and Bob, they always felt that maybe the sound of the creek had muffled their approach, and that's why they were able to surprise her. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think maybe that Patty was probably watching them approach. And she only reacted because the horses did. The horses panicked, and she knew she had been spotted, and she did what they do 98% of the time. She walked away. The only difference between this and so many other times before is Roger, being a rodeo ride, was able to maintain control a little bit when the horse almost bucked him off, and he was able to grab. There's a story, and one time even Roger said the horse fell on him, bending a stirrup. But according to Bob, he said, no, uh, 
And I didn't see that happen. Roger managed to get off the horse and he grabbed the, the camera out of the saddle bag and started filming. So those first frames, uh, you see, and they're jumping. Roger's filming as he's running and he goes down. And because he was such a short man, he was only between 5'2 and 5'3 inches tall. He came up on the other side right by uh, that S stick. And it, was, it wasn't until he passed that S stick that he uh, got, he filmed those famous frames of, and made history. And because he had spent so much of that 100 roll of film shooting each other with the pretty fall colors, there was only 952 frames left. So he just kept shooting until the film ran out. Uh, if I seem a little distracted, I, I have Bill Munz's book. Somebody said that. Yeah, I, I've read it too. Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to. Somebody said that he knew the actual lens. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very authoritative book on the, the, the minutia of the film itself. Matter of fact, one of the big stumbling blocks, according to Munz, on, on his whole research in the Paris and film was not being able to determine what lens Roger had on that camera. Right. Yeah. It makes a difference. It really yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah, it really makes a difference. And, of course, she left a great set of tracks. And Roger being Roger, after she uh, after the creature was gone, he cast what he thought were the two clearest ones close to where, where they first encountered her, right down by the creek. And I got them here. These. Yep. One left, one right foot. Cast them. And it was Bob Titmus who went down there nine days later and cast ten more prints in succession in a row. And... Uh, while we're on it, he is known as sometimes the fifth horseman. <laughs> well, according to John, he should have been one of the four horsemen. He should be there, and Peter should not. Uh, was uh, now now while we're on that topic, you know, what was your impression of Bob Titmus and Bob Titmus was a uh, a, a straightforward guy, and he uh, was basically he shunned publicity, and he just was interested in following up on on this, and became obsessed with it. And uh, he managed to get the uh, late Texas millionaire, Tom Slick, to finance him and what was called the British Columbia Expedition and up halfway up the coast of British Columbia. And that's where he, he did most of his research until uh, Slick died and the money ran out. Yep. Yeah. No, that was yeah. very unfortunate. That you know, Right. And Rene and Titmus couldn't stand each other. No. <laughs> oh, <did not. laughs> Rene, it sounds like to me, was like the ultimate carrier. He probably didn't like too many people, especially if you disagreed with him. Oh, well, Rene was very territorial. He, um, uh, to him, everyone was just some guy coming in to mess in on his, on his business. Right. You know, uh, but for, he never seemed to be ang angry at me, but what he said to, about me to other people oh, when I wasn't around, I have no idea. But, <clears throat> Rene was Rene. There's no other way to describe him. I loved the guy. We were good <laughs> friends. I loved the guy, and I like to say he loved me sometimes. Except he wanted to believe that Freeman. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rene is the one that changed my mind about right. Paul Freeman. He goes, go talk to Arden. Go talk to this guy. Go talk to that guy. And I did. And I have to admit, he had a point. You know. uh, question from the chat from Quick Witty. Hello, Quick Witty. Welcome again, sir. Uh, was Patterson trustworthy? Uh, in a lot of people's opinion, and especially Rene, Rene used to refer, refer to Rogers that little bullshit artist. <laughs> and uh, uh, Patterson was uh, into. Uh, was uh, and Rene, in fact, wanted to just prove it. That's why he was so interested in the whole whole thing he wanted to prove he wanted to prove that roger patterson had pulled this off somehow but he couldn't do it and he said what's important is what's on the film and he said i don't care if jack the ripper was holding the camera the point is what is on that film you know that sounds like that that sounds like renee in a nutshell yeah I don't yeah. Care. <laughs> yeah yeah but it's like i said roger and roger what i've known and learned of him he was like mr haney in the yakima era everybody knew him most people like him but everybody also knew don't lend him any money because the odds are you'll never get it back yep yeah now is it true i, I i've heard this in, in in pieces is that towards the end of his life uh renee kind of not believed or started to have doubts about the patterson film 
Rennie had had doubts, serious doubts about the whole thing. Gotcha. You know, because he, he had never seen anything, never come across anything. He saw footprints, you know, mm. and he was really beginning to have doubts, the whole thing. But Rene uh, was, went through a very hard time at the end of his life. And uh, he was basically mad at everything and everybody. So, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, it, was, it was sad the way it happened. But, um, right, you know, even I, I mean, Rene wanted me, uh, wanted me to buy his green camper truck, the Green Hornet. And um, I made arrangement just before he passed to do so. And I flew, I was still in Alberta at the time, and I flew to uh, Richmond to attend his memorial service. Uh, it was well attended by a lot of people, you know, and, and uh, it was a sad day. And uh, we were kind of joking because there had been a thunderstorm through that area early in the morning. It was uh, in the distance. And uh, and uh, we said, well, it looks like that thunderstorm has passed. And I think it was Larry Lund that said, no, that's not a thunderstorm. That's raining at the gates of heaven. God just told him there is no Sasquatch. He's lying and he's arguing with him. <laughs> But I went back there a week later and uh, uh, to talk with Eric, because Eric was sorting, Rennie's son was sorting out his estate, and to get the Green Hornet back, uh, ready to drive all the way to Calgary. And, uh, well, it, it, you see this truck. It was a beautiful little camper on wheels, but, oh, my God, duct tape this. Quiet. <laughs> you know, he had redone it. It was a, it was a, it was like a homemade truck, <laughs> and it was a good chance it wasn't going to pass the out of province inspection, and that was the deal breaker eventually that killed it. But uh, we needed new cables for the batteries, which for some reason the battery was not in the engine compartment, it was behind the driver's seat. <laughs> and, and we went there. I went down there with Eric and uh to the canadian tire and eric himself you know great guy uh, uh country boy canada you, you you're in this pickup truck you're up to your ankles and discarded big mac wrappers and and shake milkshake containers and stuff and he i said my god eric you gotta empty this truck out because uh you can't see your floor and say yeah i know i tell you what we're right beside the garbage cans there uh, do me a favor, throw this stuff out and I'll go in and get the cables. And I did. And I was throwing arms and this stuff in the garbage for him. And right there in that little, you know, that little lump where the gearbox is, the gear shift is where the drivetrain goes through. There was a little black shoe, half shoe box. And I picked that shoe box up and oh my God, this is nothing. This is dirt. And I had that thing right over right over the garbage can and i noticed these little white flicks i thought oh, i better not these may be seeds or something and i had and eric came back and i said i said oh wow great job i can see my floor for the first time <laughs> I said, eric what's in that little shoe box there you know i almost threw it out and he turned white as a ghost he said that's dad oh. <laughs> <laughs> I came that close to throwing my late friend Rennie to end its ashes into a garbage can of <laughs> It turned to the dump. <laughs> oh, I, was... But fortunately, I didn't do it. I never would have lived that one down. I can picture Rene up at the party. Do you know what that Schindberg did? <laughs> <laughs> I, oh. I... You know, somehow I can imagine, you know, the, the multiple, there was some movie I watched and they ended up like drinking, <laughs> they thought it was like, like supplements or something. So they, oh, this must be the protein powder. I'll put it in the, <laughs> Ugh. um, thank you, Timmy boy. And welcome Timmy boy, uh, back, uh, Jimmy boy says, Hey, wipe your feet at the door people and hit the sub and like really appreciate it to, um, uh, Sharing is caring, and uh, be sure to hit that like. And if you're not sub, sub to the channel. We have a lot of fun here. Um, so we do have uh, a couple of other questions, but I have a question before we get to those. Um, the, one of the things I noticed that caused dissension between, I believe, John Green, Roger Patterson, and I believe it was uh Renee was the Frank Curlo incident. People don't know the Frank Curlo incident. And I don't even know if you're aware of the Frank Curlo incident. 
Who's Frank Curlow? Frank Curlow apparently was the first person to claim that they had a Bigfoot body. And he had a partner, but the partner disappeared. Um, and, it, you know, it turned out to be a hoax, but it caused oh, some dissension. Oh, 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 yeah. And he had the check and he tried to hand him the check and he sat back and said, show me the Bigfoot first. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't know the particulars of it because it was covered. I'm not sure if it was covered in, in uh, either one of John Green's book or it was covered in uh, Renee's book. Uh, but I know I read it somewhere about Frank Curlow. And that, that was the first Bigfoot body hoax hoaxer. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you know any more particulars of that. I know what Renee uh, um, offered like $10,000 for it. And... Uh, but Renee was suspicious from the beginning, and John and, uh, and Peter Byrne were saying, "Well, Renee, you don't have ten thousand. What are you doing?" He said, "Yeah, but that was for a Sasquatch he didn't have." <laughs> I was going to say, did Renee had ten thousand dollars at one no, time. No, he never had that much in his life. No, but, <laughs> you know. But he said, "Yeah, I just offered it because, uh, yeah, I didn't have, it, but he didn't have a Bigfoot, so." <laughs> <laughs> And I knew it, so yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to get him to expose it. <laughs> yeah, there, there was some maneuvering by Roger Patterson during that whole thing that apparently, um, I think, kind of made John Green distance himself a little bit from the crew. I'm pretty well, sure it was. Uh, well, what 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 caused John Green and Renny to Hinden to or to in their partnership was doing the Blue Creek Mountain investigations in August, September, just before the Patterson film was shot during that investigation. They all flew down there with uh, uh, a guy named Keith Gazzara in the plane and a guy named Moffat who had a tracking dog white lady. And while they were down there at Shishwa Tracks, it was a blistering hot day. They, uh, for some, for some reason, they all ended up jumping in the Jeeps and driving to another location, but they left Renee behind. Oh, jeez. And, and Renee was stuck out there way high up on Blue Creek Mountain for like six hours. <laughs> <laughs> no water and everything. And when they all came back, Renee took that double barrel shotgun. You see Pete Cazera and most of Blue Creek Mountain footage came around. And he stuck it in John Green's face and said, you ever do that to me again, I'll blow your damn head off. Well, that would kind of make me distance yeah, myself yeah, from the person yeah. quickly. Yeah, and and John told me that story years ago, and told me to, to never say it until after he's gone, <laughs> and I did. And and and, and Renee never never ever admitted to anything like that. And I think one time he says, "I want the word even Charles in the damn thing," but <laughs> 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 you know. But that's like that's the kind of thing that happened. Of course, Green. Green after that said, I wasn't <clears throat> going near him after that. <laughs> and and Re and Rene became such a pain in the butt down there that Green had him fly back in the plane with Key Cazero, whereas Green rode in Dot Abbott's car. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, But they um, still communicated after yeah. that every now and then. Yeah. You know, it's not like they shut each other off completely. Well, so uh, just for folks to know and, and for you to know, uh, during our very, I think it was like episode number seven of Squatch Detective Radio, uh, this goes back to, I think, 2007, I think it was January of 2007, I had John Green on the show. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed him, and um, of course, that was the old blog talk days, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so the audio quality wasn't that great. But what I'm actually doing is I'm restoring my interview with him a bit and his quotes and some of his talking. And I'm actually in the process of restoring that audio to make it more high def so people can hear it better mm -hmm. and cleaning it up because at that time, you know, uh, uh, uh yeah, I'm, I'm, why am I saying Roger Patterson? Um, John Green had a lot. He was stuttering a little bit and repeating himself a lot at that point in time in his life. So I, I I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning it up to make it sound very fluid, very, very good, and not destroying the message he was putting out there. And uh, so that that hopefully I'll have that concluded within a month or so. So um, and I'll, I'll make sure I send you a copy of that. I only have one criticism with John Green. Love them. He was the worst driver that ever existed. <laughs> <laughs> he was. 
behind the wheel. He was dangerous. I don't know how he lived so long. <laughs> <laughs> he oh let his wife God. drive. That's probably why. Yeah. Oh my God. It was awful. Scary. <laughs> Pulling out, pulling out to pass a truck, a Greyhound bus coming. <laughs> oh, like, wow! <laughs> he, he didn't think anything. Like, <laughs> oh, he was a horrible driver. A horrible driver. Well, maybe maybe a hundred years from now, when we're all sitting at, sitting beyond the pearly gates, we we can challenge money. We can watch a race between him and Matt Moneymaker. <laughs> John Green would win. Hands down, if he didn't go up in a burning ball of flame somewhere. <laughs> I, I asked, I used to ask June, how can you stand riding with him? Mm. She just says, I just tune out. <laughs> no, we, we would call that race the White Knuckle 500. <laughs> I don't think John ever got met with you. The only argument I ever had with John Green really was about the Patterson film. Because John was adamant right up until about 2010 that, that Roger, once he started, got, crossed the creek and was filming Patty and got 352 and that, that sequence, that Roger never changed position. I said, yes, he did, John. You can see it. He walks up to that log you see in 352, and he's either standing right beside it or he's straddling the damn thing. No, he did. He never changed position. I said, yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> and he eventually showed it, and he must have seen it a million times. He goes, maybe you're right. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think if you listen to Bob Gimlin describe it, he did. He stopped, yeah. and he, he fell, and he, he got down, and he shot with his elbows, with his elbows in the ground. Well, it's still debatable whether he got down on one knee or not. Um, um, uh, but when he filmed those famous sequences, he stood in one spot, and then when, when he lost sight of her in the, that little batch of clumpy trees there in the middle, he changed his position, and he moved right up to the log in 352. And that's where you see those last few frames with her straight from the back. Yep. Uh, so we, we got so many questions popping up in, in chat right now, and we're going to uh, – somebody had asked earlier on, uh, Em and Chris – no, was it Eamon Chris? I forget. Uh, but anyway, somebody asked if you knew Robert W. Morgan. No, I've never met Robert Doug W. Morgan. So no. that answers that question. Yeah. Uh, maybe you know, but Nick was wondering uh, how much R Renee made doing those kokanee beer commercials. Probably not much. A qu a quite a bit. He was afraid he was going to have to pay income tax. <laughs> oh, jeez. <geez. laughs> I... They gotta stop sending me these checks. I'm gonna have to play income tax on this crap. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh. Oh boy. Now, now we're really reaching for the bottom of the barrel. Um. Nick wants to know if you have any stories about uh, the late John Eric Beckchard. Oh God, we could do a whole show on that. Uh. John Eric Beckchard used to phone me at three o'clock in the morning and stop pretending to be a professor from some university. <laughs> but he always see right through it and you go, hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know it was me? And I said, it's always you. <laughs> <laughs> Beckchard was, um, I like to say the Sasquatch field today more resembled the asylum but being taken over by the inmates. Now, back in the early days, when I started, most of the guys were strict zoological, but there were a few exceptions, and he was one of the biggest ones. And he used to show up at the conferences wearing an ET mask and dancing around, and he'd create quite a disturbance. And he'd end up, always end up getting kicked out. And then he'd be marching up and down the outside, passing out pamphlets of how they were throwing him out because they were afraid to know the truth and stuff like that. Eric Becher was quite a character. A nice guy, but he was absolutely yeah. hard playing nuts. Right. Yeah. yeah, and a very super intelligent guy, too. Yes. Yes, but he was crazy. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, so I don't know if he was crazy or crazy like a fox. No, he was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one story when the conference in, uh, in the University of British Columbia, uh, we're all staying at the, because, you hold know. On, hold on, stop. They actually let him into Canada? Oh, yeah. Mistake oh, yeah. number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and... Uh, you, you always see him. He always had that pink tie, and he was always carrying a great big brown paper, uh, like, shopping bag and stuff in it. I go, 
And of course, the, the theater where the conference is on the other side of campus, I see him standing there and I'm driving by my old Land Rover and I, I kind of look the other <laughs> as I'm going by, pretend I don't see him. And I swear I got half a kilometer down the road and all of a sudden I hear, wham, 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 I stop my truck. I look at the passenger side rear view mirror, there he is, running beside my truck, banging on it. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay, John, I'll give you a ride. <laughs> So you literally, you 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 literally chased me halfway across the camp. <laughs> You're halfway there. You can run yeah. the rest of the way. <laughs> uh, I guess it was possible because the speed limit there was only like 10 kilometers an hour, and I always obeyed the speed limit. My mistake that day. <laughs> <laughs> Gun it, he's running after us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he, he'd come up, and he always stayed at John Green's house because John would always uh, – I would let people who were visiting stay in the spare rooms downstairs. You let me stare a number of time. But oh my god! I, I always noticed June always made me do the dishes, and I always said, <laughs> said "You make anyone else do the dishes?" And they just smiled. And I, I don't think they did, quite frankly, but they always made me do the dishes. But Vetcher would always stay with the greens, and 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 whoever. <laughs> I just say he just go on and on about his weird and wacky theories and stuff like that, and I just. Mm. June probably didn't want him to have to do do the dishes. She just wanted him out. <laughs> Go play with your little alien friends out yeah, in the backyard. Yeah. John Eric Bertram was a nice guy, but he was he was yeah. certifiably crazy. Yep. 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 Uh, yeah, a mix says Becker was a member of Mensa, but he had blind spots of common sense that made him dangerously close to being an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> the BFF, the Bigfoot Forum, uh, oh my uh, God. Uh, referred to him as the man who could not be named. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he got banned from it very quickly, and he made such a nuisance of himself with everybody. They referred to him that you, you weren't allowed to say his name or you'd get banned. <laughs> that's, that's you you couldn't true. Beetlejuice him, huh? You couldn't say his name three times or he'd show up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say, say Betcher three times and he'll yeah. show up. Yeah. And, and you know what? I'm afraid to say that now because he's gone. And if I say his name three times, he might his ghost may show up. <laughs> I wish the ghost of one of them would come back and just tell me, is the Sasquatch really there or am I wasting my time? Well, I think the ghost of Bexter would probably come back and tell you it's an alien from another or, planet. Or uh, came from the fourth dimension. You know? Yep. <laughs> Or, or like Kalani, you know, you just go up the top of Mount Breckenridge and fill your life, uh, mind with love thoughts, and he'll come and talk to you. Now, Kalani was really the first one to start that all up, wasn't he? I'm not sure if he was the first. He's one of the few that are still going. Again, a real nice guy. Yeah, nice yes, guy. Absolutely. But he's, but he's, he's a, a fun guy to talk to. But he is a hippie that never grew up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he seems at least in my opinion yeah. okay. to me you know even Becker, even though he had all these crazy ideas you know unless you tangled with him and, and and whatever he was for the most part harmless yes he had a lot of internet oh yeah he was he was irritating and, for being so silly no you know and that's it but he never he was never uh dangerous or anything like that and no. um Yes, uh, quick witty. We're going to get to your questions in a second. We're, we're going to. I haven't lost it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you know, but then you look at people like Dr. Matt Johnson that are doing stuff, that, you know, because of the, the, the atmosphere he's creating. I think he's creating his own cult. Well, Dr. And, Matthew Johnson came prominent when he so called had that encounter with his family. And it's funny because I have a video. Uh, I forget what year it was. It had to be in the early 90s um, of you. And then a little while later, Matt Johnson comes on to talk and talks yeah, about this. That was a, a remake. Yeah, uh, that was a remake. They tried to remake um, uh, one of the Leonard Nimoy series from the 70s. Um, Unsol what was it called? Unsolved Mysteries? No, no, in, search of, in Search Of. In Search Of. In Search Of. And they tried to re reboot it, and the host of the show was the guy who played Agent um, uh, Skinner in the X Files. And uh, I was pretty upset because they edited it and made me sound like I was saying something completely opposite of what I was saying. 
Uh, my, my future. I almost get the impression at the time that the, the Johnson was first came prominence after his so-called encounter with his family. At the time in the UFO field, there was a guy writing books called Communion and things like that. And he was sort of a psychiatrist who uh, uh, wanted to deal with so-called alien abductees. And it almost sounded to me like Dr. Matthew Johnson was trying to set himself up like like that to be a sort of someone that people who have encounters with Sasquatch could talk to. And that's what he was trying to do. Yeah. At least yeah. at first. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask? Uh, well, anyway, let's get to quick witty's question. Um, uh, what do you think of how to hunt? Uh, and, uh, Bigfoot, Odyssey, and other Bigfoot business tactics. I, I uh, how to hunt, um, uh, Steve is Steve as all. Yeah. As all. Uh, I don't have any time for, because when, yeah. when he first got involved, he said things about, uh, John green and, you know, and you met, yeah. uh, everybody. And he even tried to accuse John green's father, trying to, ex you know, exterminate the Japanese Canadians during the war and things like that, which was absolute nonsense. And then he accused them all, John Green late Ray tried to compare him to Hollywood producers who abuse women and all that stuff. Right. So I got no time for anything that guy says. He's a and guy. Then, he's a guy who had a hunting uh, 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 guide, grizzly guide. That when they banned the the grizzly hunt in BC, he had to find something else to make his uh, to pay. And he's got he got involved in the Sasquatch, and I think he's just trying to uh, make his site pay. Because uh, all he does is read emails, right? Yeah. And I, I, in, in front of these beautiful things that could be a backdrop, <laughs> when you were talking about the Rocky Mountains, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of. Well, he does live that. up in the Whistle area, and all you have to do is go out anywhere, and you got beautiful scenery all around you. Yeah, yeah. so he could be, he could be doing it right out of his backyard. Yeah. yeah, um, but he does go out into the woods. He does. He was a he was a bear hunting guide for years. And, and and a hunting guide for years, and that and that income has been taken away from him. And I think this is just one of the things. But he's arrogant as you wouldn't believe. You know, at least yeah. that's my impression of him. And I think he got involved with uh, guys who are pushing the uh, massacre nonsense. And he's the the latest one who brought all that up again. That's when we had your. I was on your show uh, a year yeah. or so ago when you had the whole mic. Like, the cell phone up in front of your mic. You talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was him that got all that going. Got people talking about that nonsense yep. all over again. So no, um, how to hunt? Nah, he's just a another guy who's, and I'm only expressing my opinion, uh, tooting his own horn, trying to be, uh, you know, famous without doing the work and being very abrasive about it. And, yeah, yeah. And the funny thing about that is. Um, he has not only had issues like that now in the Bigfoot community, but prior to that, he was having similar in the hunting community or the guide community. Well, if you read, if you read the, 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 some of the things that were said on the hunting guide pages before he got in Bigfoot. Yeah, you're right. He was, you know, he was called yeah. into question about some of his things he was showing and mm -hmm. some of his, some of his tips. Yeah. And he would come back being very, you know, brash and arrogant yeah. and, Similarly, very threatening. In fact, there was one uh, wolf uh, uh, rescue, or not a wolf rescue, but they were they were trying to conserve wolves, and he had gotten a little spat on a forum with them, and then he actually sent them a basically a threat, um, you know, and and that's posted on their website that I just happened to uh, um, pop in, and um, yeah, he, uh, some of the comments we were getting. Uh, um, comments about is like uh, they they don't take criticism very well he doesn't take criticism very well um uh absolutely arrogant was another comment um i i, I still assume it's the same after what he said about john green and stuff like that i yeah. i never watched another one of his videos and i won't or the or the purposely yep. calling meldrum meldum yeah yeah, stuff like that. I mean, he, you know, uh, Rick Ariolo is really tearing him apart on his new uh, new mm. series of, of podcasts there. And uh, mm. 
you know, he, he says it right. Uh, and, and Don Fuller just said, I was, as I was just reading it, his Dale's a gaslighter. Of course, Richter's got this crazy sense of humor and it's not for everybody, but if you want to check out him, uh, that's his season this year is probably machine gunning. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I don't think his Dell gives a rat. Oh, he, he does. He, He's already responded to the first video. No, no, I don't think yeah. he gives a rat's behind whether the Sasquatch exists or not. Oh, yeah. I think he's just trying to make his his uh, his uh, site pay, and as long as he gets uh, a few thousand followers, that's fine for him. Well, yeah, uh, I'm coming out with a video real soon about him. I'm working on that too, um, but he has put out, you know, stuff. Uh, like the Mark Anders hoaxes, those, mm-hmm. you know, those uh, Mark Anders is an admitted hoaxer, I believe, and, and, mm-hmm. and, and put stuff out there for shock value, and it's not real, and there was one that was called the Mexican Bigfoot. Well, Isdale actually posted that on his How to Hunt Facebook page, along with a footprint, which is on the back of his book, mm-hmm. and doesn't say, oh, what would, you know, what do you do when you see this on your trail camera, you know? Well, it's a hoax picture, you know, from, and everybody thought it was his and he responds by not responding. Mm-hmm. You know, is that yours? When did you get it? It says nothing. Creates all this buzz. Well, it's, it's a hoax picture. So. Well, he me, did have a video. I noticed at one point where he, he, he was basically saying, this is a footprint and I found it. Yeah. And there was something there with the general foot sheet. But my, my question is, First of all, it's it's an opening in the woods, and there's absolutely nothing in front of it and nothing behind it. So what what did the Sasquatch do? Hop down out of a helicopter and stomp one foot down and then go right back up again? Uh, you know, no follow-up, and he just reads whatever people tell yeah. him. Yeah, you know? I, I mean, obviously he's not using his his great acumen as a, you know, a tracker and a hunter. Yeah to do any investigation whatsoever that much is yeah. for sure oh, that was another- yeah. Yeah. i i don't waste any time with him mm-hmm. I, I i don't believe a word he says and nope. i uh i i won't waste any time with, yeah. with him no no yeah. no it's just uh, like like um the biggest example of what i call ivan marks today is um uh, todd standing i don't believe a word that man says either so yeah. um okay Uh, well, you know, here, you know, and that, that is true. Some people are, yeah, quick witty's having an issue with the show, Bigfoot Odyssey doing raffles and stuff like that during the shows or whatever. And, um, no, I, uh, you know, and quick witty said that, you know, I go on expeditions and I don't ask money or do fake raffles or anything like that. Uh, very true. Um, if, um, Somebody wants to come on an expedition with me. I, I'm doing something there in the area, you know, where they, they're in my area. Call me. It'd be my honor to show them around. And if you want to go poking around, I'm more than happy to do that. I don't want to do anything on a huge scale, uh, obviously. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just my philosophy. Um, I don't knock people that try to, um, you know, hey, look, we're all trying to fund our own stuff here. That's, you know, quick witty, just so you understand, you know, that's why my YouTube channel is monetized. That's why Anchor FM is monetized. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, I, you know, I, I have written three books because uh, it helps me recoup a lot of the thousands of dollars I've spent in equipment. And even Mike can attest, I've spent a lot of money doing this. Yeah, um, it's not cheap to go and get a, you know, a couple thousand dollar thermal camera or night vision i mean i'm i'm probably right now in the woods probably sitting on about five thousand dollars worth of equipment of my own you know and you know the the subjects kept me bankrupt for more than i can say yes yeah you you gotta pay for gas to get out in the woods sometimes you know (laughs) and And, um, sometimes those raffles have to come out you know just to you know not merely to get your name out there but more to you know the gear to, to, to put the content out i mean and I, I think it would be an appropriate time to do a plug for myself. Oh. <laughs> I've written three books. If you want to check them out, we have 50 large true story of the Bigfoot body hoax. Uh, the, the, yeah, now I'm forgetting my own books, the Sasquatch playbook, which is my last, uh, which is my last book, which is uh, basically looking at the Bigfoot uh, mystery from a believer 
but using a skeptical approach. And then my one that's been out there for so many years now, um, what would Sasquatch do using primate behavior to validate the Bigfoot mystery? Um, you can find those on squatchdetective.com. Just click on the on the book you want to look at, and it'll take you right to the Amazon page to purchase it. So there's my cheap plug for the night. You know, every little dime helps. Um, that's why I do it. We are setting a Patreon page up, and we're going to have some exclusive content for that as well. That's where the John Green uh, interview is going to head to when we're done with it because it takes time to do that. And this is just a way, quick way, I recoup. Um, uh, that and quick video says, Steve, that's that he actually said that's how to properly fund an expedition. I agree. Uh, you know, I don't like taking people, uh, for money just to take them out in the woods. So that's just not my thing. Now, if I'm providing food, uh, like for example, the expedition I went on, uh, just recently with the Kentucky Bigfoot Research Organization, excellent expedition. They paid a fee, but their camping was taken care of. They, they, rented all the camping spots so their food was taken care of so they got food so what their money basically paid for it was their food and their camping and if there's a little and you know if there's a little extra for the organizer so be it um that's I, re I really have no problem with people trying to find ways of making this pay i mean yeah. the late uh friend of mine late bill miller just passed away uh october last had a little started a little tour company here called Sasquatch Country Adventures in the Harrison area where we'd take three or four people out. But it wasn't really an expedition type thing. It was basically show them areas where things happened and explain the history of it to people who were interested. Yeah, and Bill put all that money into sponsoring trips into the bush to actually look for evidence. And that, that was fine. I had no problem. I helped them out with it quite a bit. And uh, we got a lot of positive feedback on it, but that died when uh, that whole thing died when, when Bill died, because I wasn't interested in carrying on with a tour company, and, uh, right. running a tour company. I, I just, I, I want to look for the Sasquatch. I don't want to. I want, I want, yeah. I want to be tour guides for people and things and, like that. And quickly, I have people go out with me all the time, but I do it for free. Yep, so, okay. same here. Yep. Yeah. Same here. Uh, quick with he says, obviously, uh, the first thing they mention is we need to make money for this and we need money for that. No books, no nothing in return. And I, I, I tend to agree with my philosophy. But you know what? Here's the thing. Nobody is forcing anybody to pay for those things. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to put $5 into a raffle, then, then fine. You know that that you, nobody's being forced to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't ask for any money to watch this podcast. I never will. I I won't make this a member only podcast. You know, I'll get paid the the the, the peanuts that go, that YouTube will throw at me. That's fine. I'm going to have a Patreon page, and again, that's voluntary. If people want to go over there and be a um, a, a contributor to the show, then they can do it. I'm not forcing them to, I'm not mad. I'm not going to treat anybody any differently if they don't. Um, but you know, the, the, again, I do offer stuff and I'm a very firm believer generally. And that's why I'm not really pushing the Patreon page at all is because I don't have that content yet. When I start putting content, exclusive content to that Patreon page, then people are getting something in return. You know, and I am a firm believer in, um, I am a very firm believer in, you know, you, you pay some money, you should get something in return. Now, a raffle is kind of, you know, that, that's a chance. That's like a lottery. If, if that's what people want to do and they want to, it's no different than going to the store and buying a lottery ticket. Nobody is forcing them to. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's the same with, with, with the people who don't like conferences. And, and I understand that it's a double edged sword with conferences because people say, well, there's the people trying just to push their egos and talk and do all that stuff. But I've always found it, you know, like when I, when I go to conferences and Mike, and Mike's been to a number of them. Do I ever sit and listen to the speakers? No, I'm out there mingling and talking and I have my own table to deal with, but the, that's what I like conferences for is that, that camaraderie and meeting people and, and getting to know people and getting the stories and all that kind of stuff. That's the fun bit for me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the networking. I mean, my memories came up today from Eric's event from four years ago, you know, came up in the old Verizon cloud today with everybody. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the big thing going to those things and, and interacting with everybody. I mean, 
we're doing it this weekend, you know, next weekend that we'll be mm -hmm. out. So. Well, Mike, you're out looking for evidence right now, ain't you? That's why you, you, you had, had trouble getting here earlier. You're finding a spot where you can transmit from. <laughs> yeah, and it, I have never seen golf ball size snowflakes. <laughs> I'll send you guys some, some photos later. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the places we've been and the weird stuff we've seen. Um, but uh, yeah, and I apologize for signal. We we got up there. We had full four bars. Don't uh, ever uh, don't ever apologize for going into the bush looking for evidence, sir. That's, that's right. What we, that's what we should be doing right now. You're doing the right thing. Well, it's it's. Yeah. I appreciate it because usually we'll go out and we'll turn you got turn <clears throat> Steve on or one of you. You know, if you you're out somewhere, we're listening to things. Mm -hmm. We'll turn on some of the other podcasts and we'll listen to them. And hey, it might draw something in because who knows who's playing what scream or whatever. So, <laughs> I've I've never owned a laptop computer, so I couldn't transmit from the bush even if I wanted to. <laughs> and and. Uh in central florida i agree with that i'm not here to defend bigfoot alley to be fair and accurate the facts is all i'm saying i have a chance to win a four thousand dollar drone so i took a chance free will Maybe. did he win the drone not well we don't know yet no oh, that's too bad i, I, I <laughs> hope he does <laughs> and, and, and if, i hope you win the drone <laughs> and i got to give a shout out to the central bigfoot or central florida bigfoot you know i met him through another podcast in, in through instagram and he took me out in the woods and uh I got to go out in the swamps in Florida and learn about Florida. So uh, Matt's a cool dude. Um, so I had, you, a you know, up, I, I had a guy show up here. He just wanted me to tell him about some of the more classic cases that are local, like the Ruby Creek and the Jocko capture. I said, are you doing anything this afternoon? He said, no. I loaded in my car and I took him to the Chapman site and I took him to tunnel number four where Jack got made his year. Yep. You know, yeah. made his yeah. year. He wanted to give me, uh, he tried to hand me a couple hundred bucks. I said, no, no, no. I'll tell you what, you can buy dinner. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm like a, I'm like another Canadian who charges like 3000 to $4,000 <laughs> to take on an expedition where he's pointing out all these tree breaks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and has, and has Sasquatch gloves in his back seat. Mm. <laughs> well, you know, not, his back not, seat. not mentioning any names. Touch him. That's right. Yeah, gotcha. um, yeah. No. So, Tom, can I ask what what the 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 I don't know what the the most important evidence or the the most striking I guess I want to go most striking evidence that really hit to the core that you found that it really keeps you going had to be and it did keep me going because at the time I was married and I was getting a lot of pressure from my ex wife to put the Sasquatch in the back burner and concentrate on more important things. Had to be the footprints found along uh, Bald Beard Creek near the Chilliwack River in 1986. Uh, I've written about this quite ex uh, Actually, no, I haven't written about this one a lot, but I have written about it. Uh, it was a, a sighting that happened uh, by an American couple who were fishing down here during Expo year in 1986. I found the tracks. The witnesses never saw them. And there were... There were over a hundred of them. If I hadn't come across that, and I couldn't explain them away, no matter how hard I tried. And if I hadn't come across that and saw that myself and cast a couple of them myself, I might have said, okay, a Sasquatch is keep it on the back burner as a hobby to do in your spare time instead of devoting your life to it, which is I ended up doing. And um, and that was the that's the most fascinating case of, of personal evidence that I have ever come across. So far, every time I've sent in hair samples and stuff to be examined, they've come back with common animal explanations. Thank yeah. you. So, yeah. Yeah. You, Things you know, like that. Yeah. Finding tracks. I mean, and I, and I talk about yeah. how I found, I, I actually heard and smelled what made my track. Yeah. And then to, track the one that was right off the trail and then come back the next day when it's daylight out mm -hmm. and find the trackway mm -hmm. going uphill. That really just, you know, I sit there and I think to myself, yeah, you know, if even, even though I've had my own sightings, mm -hmm. I, you know, you still, you always doubt that part, you know, like, yeah. well, maybe I was just imagining the whole thing. You yeah. Know? You get, always second guess yourself. Maybe yeah. I was, maybe, you know, uh, but, uh, I, but I can't throw those tracks away. Yeah, and and to and to 
and to answer a sort of a part two to Mike's question, 2004, I may have finally saw one myself. Okay. I might have. I won't say it was because it was just too damn far away. Uh, and I've always had the philosophy, stick to the facts, never deviate from the facts. In 2004, I saw a figure. It was jet black in color, and it appeared to be walking upright. But I only hey. saw for about four seconds. Hey. But it's also, I couldn't see details, so I can't say with 100% certainty it wasn't a really big, odd-looking guy way up there. Well, what he would be doing there, I don't know. If that was a Sasquatch, I have seen one. If it was not, I still have not. And that was in BC? Yes. Yep. West side of Harrison Lake, uh, uh, just before the, the uh, turn off to Mystery Valley. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this, and, and please understand this quickly, is that I, my show is not to trash other shows. Uh, there are a lot of shows on, on YouTube. Uh, everybody has their own taste in what they want to watch and what they don't want to watch. Uh, this show is not the cup of tea for everybody. And I'm sure, you know, uh, all the other shows are, you know, have the same thing that not every show is a cup of tea for every single person. So no. I try to put what I feel is the best product forward and the most honest and integrity filled product forward. Does that mean that some night I may have a guest on that may be pulling the wool over my eye? Present company excluded, of course, Mr. Steenberg. <laughs> um, yeah, that may happen. I may get a witness on here someday that may be completely bogus. Mm -hmm. happens we've had you know years ago we had ed smith on the show ed smith was the daisy in the box hoaxer from mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. um stuff like that happens um does that make me i mean like i say when i put a witness on i'll ask them questions it's not my i'm not investigating them mm -hmm. uh it's my job to interview them this is a radio mm -hmm. this is a show so I, I take a different seat here a lot unless I'm doing something special. So, you know, when I have a witness on, it's about getting their story out and let the audience be the judge of the, the material. Yeah, and I'm um, not naive to believe that everyone I've ever interviewed was yeah. telling me the truth. I'm, 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 yeah. I tend to believe a lot of them really believe they saw something. And you, you always say there's only three possibilities when you're interviewing a witness. Only three. Yeah. One they saw a Sasquatch. Two, they mistook someone or something for a Sasquatch, or three, they're lying. Those are the only three possibilities. There are no others. And if the Sasquatch doesn't exist <laughs> and never did, they're all either mistaken or they're lying. And, and quick when he says, come on, Steve, stick to your guns. Those guys are phony. How long have you been doing this? Well, I started this, uh, the podcast in 2006. So, yeah, we're, we're coming up on a long time doing this, 15 years. But here's the thing, Quick Witty, um, and Mike can attest to this. I don't listen. I very rarely listen to other podcasts. Rarely. I don't have time. Something. Huh? Yeah. Unless I, I, I just, send something to you or somebody yeah. else sends. Yeah, I, I just don't have the time. I You know, I, I do watch Squatch Talk occasionally. I don't catch every episode. I catch when I can. Because, you know, I've had Pat Turner on the show and I try to support his show a little bit because he's bringing out stuff that that is honest. Um, but, if you know, truthfully, I don't listen to shows that espouse a lot of stories. Um, you know, I, I don't listen to many podcasts. I catch, you know, stuff that maybe evidence if somebody's putting out evidence, then I'll catch it or I'll try to catch at least part of the replay of it. But very rarely do I listen to, you know, podcasts. I just don't have the time in the day. I'm a working guy, you know, so I, I, I put my eight hours in. I come home. I got to do my man chores. Um, I got my own stuff I got to do. Um, I got to deal with my own YouTube channel, Facebook page, Twitter page, you know, and Mike kicks me because I don't, I neglect my Instagram page. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, I, it's, I have a lot of my plates. Comedies, you know, you get you, you you're gonna you're gonna pick your channel, be it you know yep. one of the main networks or one of the offshoot networks. It's just, yep. uh, and we appreciate Mr. Steenberg being here, you know, and I appreciate being part of this tonight because you know a lot of the ones that I listen to are people I've been in the woods with or met, you yep. know, and been out there, and that's why I follow their yep. shows. I wish I could follow more shows. So, yeah. Just, yeah, there's not enough time in the day. So I appreciate uh, that being said, 
for the folks, the folks that are out there and listen to this show or, or watch this show live, and for those on Anchor FM and on iHeartRadio and Spotify and uh, Stitcher uh, and Apple Podcasts, you know, if you guys have some free time on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, just pop on over to YouTube.com forward slash Steve Coles and, and visit us live. Say hello. Drop in on us once in a while. Uh, you know, even if it's for five minutes just to say hello, we'd love to hear from you. So, um, but we appreciate the time people spend to listen and, and have great input to this show because our audience has always asked some great questions. And I appreciate um, that greatly. Um, you know, that you, you know, this new platform over, you know, it will be two years on this platform coming up in August and we've grown it and changed it and switched it. And I really think that, you know, we're, we're starting to find a rhythm here. Mm. Um, so, um, I, you know, and, you know, I say, you know, and this is one of the things about this show, uh, no question is off grounds. You can ask me tough questions. I don't care. I like tough questions. That's what I love. I, I, I like the audience because I'm hopefully helping the audience, uh, newcomers who are just getting into yep. this and wonder if they should or not. I say go for it. Yep. But uh, adopt a philosophy like I always have, like mine is stick to the facts, never deviate from the facts, and have a healthy dose of skepticism because a healthy dose of skepticism is the best thing a researcher can have. Maybe. I mean, there are so many people in this field now who are, call themselves researchers. I mean, to me, a researcher is someone asking a question is trying to find an answer to the question. And it's somebody who may, you know, even though I don't believe it, I accept the possibility that in the end I could turn out to be wrong. I mean, the Sasquatch may indeed just be a great piece of North American mythology and folklore. I don't personally believe that, but I accept the possibility. Right. So many of these people who call themselves researchers, they're more like religious leaders pushing a faith. You know, it's, they, they're convinced. How they use it's their job to convince everyone else, like a, like a, a, a rabbi or a priest on a pulpit, you know, and that's just the wrong way to go about it, at least in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to say that, you know, in the chat that comes through on, on this show and, and Tom, you and I usually run the chats. You're usually on Facebook. I'm usually running YouTube watching and the questions are, are awesome. I learned from, from everybody in there. And when you seniors in the field get in there and drop little comments in, it's like, okay. Hey, easy with that term, seniors. <laughs> I just turned 60. Next year, I'm turning 59. I'm just counting backwards from now on. <laughs> you know, back in the day. Yeah, well, remember, remember you guys we used to hit the trees with sticks. Yeah. Now the kids use a computer to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, I spent my for most of my career in this. We didn't even have computers. I wasn't even online until 2004. Hey, so, and welcome. You, Oops, sorry, Steve. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome, Farrell. Good to see you. Uh, he's from uh, Calgary, Alberta. Ah, uh, cool. Love, I um, love Alberta. We spent a lot of years there on the east side of the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. A lot of, uh, my first book was about Alberta. No one had ever done a book about Alberta before. And I said, well, they've been seen in here in eastern BC. They've got to be seen here too. My first 24 years was in. I didn't move to BC till actually to 2002. Yep. Yeah, all that. Quick, he made another comment too. Uh, he just said that that's the difference, Steve. You wouldn't ban me for asking simple questions, and they did. And mm -hmm. Quick Whitty usually asks some of the toughest questions we've had out there. Sometimes, like he yeah. he called on to the carpet. Uh, you know, somebody. Well, where does your expedition money go? How much? You know, he and of course we we asked that, and I I always predicate that to some people that hey, I, you know, this is a question from the chat. We got it. You know, we're going to ask it. We were nothing is off bounds unless there is something specific like an NDA or in place that, then, you know, we'll work with it. Well, it's like when we went on a ex uh, expedition uh, or operation sea monkey in 2016, I hated that name. <laughs> <laughs> People were all asking Todd, Todd, where did that money go? And I said, what do you think it went? It paid for the gas. It paid for the food. And we paid for the boat owner and the captain. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mick made a it question. Was Port Chatham uh, expedition. It was called Operation Sea Monkey. It was in the islands between Vancouver Island and the mainland. Yes, you went. Uh, you went. You went a boating with Todd Neese. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, Rob Moore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mick, Mick said the blog talk days were fun in their own right. I wish Steve could find the episode with Beckford and repost it. That was a funny show. <laughs> funny you should say that, Mick, because that's one of the shows that is going to Patreon. Because <laughs> some of the really, because I do have a lot of the old shows, um, you know, and, and some of the folks remember Dr. Uh, Wolf Hunter Farenbach. Oh, fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, he was great. He was a great yeah. I- I- interviewer, a uh, great interview as well. Um, yeah, it's you know, a pity he doesn't seem to be involved anymore. I haven't heard from him in a long time. No, he retired from it, uh, as yeah. did Jimmy Chilcutt. Yeah, Jimmy was an interesting fellow, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, I never, you know, uh, Dr. Leroy Fish passed away before I could yeah. ever get him on. He was a, uh, he was a wildlife biologist, wasn't he? I yeah, Brian Sykes passed away recently as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, um, John Bernanagle lost. Well, him of course, I was going to say. Yeah, I mean, you had a lot of interaction with Doctor John, I believe. Yeah, and I'm sorry that, that you know you lost your friend, and I, I you know, I know you guys. I've lost know. a lot of my friends. Yeah. I mean, they're all, and, they're all gone. Yeah, yeah. I know. I had the chance to meet uh, Doctor John back in 2006 on our Monster Quest episode, mm-hmm. and he actually looked at my print, and that, that was kind of the coolest thing. Mm-hmm. Um. So, uh, okay. So we do have a question from, uh, from, uh, Farrell uh, coming up here and it's like, what's your take on the Calgary sighting that's supposed to take place in Calgary park area. It's a very interesting video. Kid says that isn't human. It looked big and moved very fast. I know exactly the one he's talking about. I think they were looking at a moose from the back. It was a okay. moose that got up and walked away. And what, what struck me most was the attitude of the adults in that in that situation. I think the adult kind of knew it because his attitude was, let's get the kids away. There's something unknown here that could be harmful or something like that. It, it was like, ooh, gee, wow, look, kids, Santa Claus, ooh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think what it was was a moose, right, okay. probably a female moose without antlers, and it, and it was sitting there, and it got up and walked yeah. away at their approach. Yeah. That's what I think it was. I've looked at it a dozen times, and that's what I think it was. And there you go. There's an I haven't seen it. So it look it looks bipedal because you're looking at it directly from the back. So we we got two other questions. One for me uh, was it 2013, Steve, when you flew to Hollywood, California, to call Rick Dyer's Bluff? Yes, was and uh, I did, and I met Susie Mateus, who runs the Bigfoot community on Facebook. And, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, but, but we, we ended up, uh, they ended up picking me up at the airport. We ended up going to a bar, having a couple of cocktails, enjoying our time. And, uh, then we had in and out burger and I flew home. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, got my in and out burger fix and off I went. <laughs> um, uh, here it is. Uh, whoop, hang on. No, 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 uh, where is it? Oh, Timmy boy. <laughs> Has Thomas ever phoned Bigfoot? <laughs> No, but I think he's phoned me half a dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> or at least people trying to be one. <laughs> Funny thing is, in that whole thing, and, and uh, Ken Collins, um, you know, he was the organizer of that event, and poor Ken is catching hell for that, folks. He didn't plan it. He didn't know it. It was just as a surprise to him as everybody else. So just <laughs> please let the pressure off of, of – uh, so we got a bunch of questions coming through. Uh, first one is quick witty. Um, uh, any thoughts on aggressive Sasquatch evidence they found in the brushy road Creek area. I don't know if you've heard any of that. I've heard uh, it said in Texas that they seem to have a more aggressive animal in, 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 in general and people are disappearing and stuff like that. But I noticed you don't seem to be much police interest in these cases. And that's huge because why yeah. not the police want to be yeah, involved? Yeah, yeah, And uh, I, think if, <coughs> I think if the Sasquatch was aggressive or we had some kind of monster out there, we'd know more about them by now. Yep. But on the uh, same time, people do disappear wilderness areas every year. And uh, I think if you ran into a hostile Sasquatch, you would tend to disappear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from, from our good friend Tate, who has – a great first name, not so great last name, <laughs> Tate Hieronymus. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Hold it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Wrong Tate. Wrong Tate. 
He says, what do you think guys think of Les Stroud Survivor and Bigfoot series? I have no problem with Les Stroud. I, yep. I think he was taken in by Todd Stanning, though, a bit. Yep. Oh, not a bit, a lot. <laughs> or, he was, or he was just playing along. He knew Todd Sam was pulling his leg, and he just played along for the show. I don't know. But his new series is just him. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen, I don't know if you've seen any of those. No, I don't. Uh, I yeah. don't have cable TV. Oh, okay. I gave it up. So his new series is just him going out in his camera and going out, mm -hmm. doing all the stuff they need to do to find Bigfoot. And it's very, very critical, skeptical. Um, I felt it was very honest, you know. Well, good. I'm glad he yeah. is because, like I said, I always like Les Stroud as an outdoor enthusiast and survivalist. I always liked what he did, but when he got involved with Todd Sand, I said, oh, come on, man. You can't be this gullible. Yep. And yeah. Bob Lemley mentioned it's on YouTube, so you can check oh, it out. Oh, it is? On, okay, yeah. yeah, I will. Thank you. Yeah. 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 We'll check you it out. I've watched some. Yep. Sorry, Steve. He, he actually reached out to, uh, to Ray about his story down in South America, so... Oh, cool. You know, he's way before he was doing the other stuff. So gotcha. uh, that whole survival thing. So it's the background on that is a, that's one of my guys he reached out to that had a very <clears throat> encounter. Yep. And I, I don't know if you've heard Ray's story, um, Tom. Ray was an Army Ranger medic. Mm -hmm. And he was in Central America uh, with a, a, a Ranger um, battalion, not a battalion, but a um, special team. Special yeah. team, and they were uh, working against FARC at the time, the uh, insurgent group there. Mm -hmm. And his uh, platoon—that's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. His platoon had at least a couple of encounters with the uh, Mapanguari, mm -hmm. which is the the, um, uh, the the South American, Central American version of Bigfoot. And uh, his story is truly amazing. And he had another follow-up story where he actually got separated from his platoon and was lost for 22 days in the, in the, in the jungles of Central America. So um, mm -hmm. very, very great. It's, if you ever catch it, it's somewhere on. We didn't have. Actually, it was on the blog talk side, I think. Mm -hmm. We had him on. We'd love to get Ray back, too, by the way, Mike. Just to do I'll grab again. him. Yeah, just to do it again on video he, for the new audience. You say he was a ranger? Yes. United yeah. States Rangers? United States Army, Army Ranger, yep. And what year was this? Oh, we had it, I think it was 83, 84 that this had happened. No, it's, I think it is, it generally, is it generally mm -hmm. that all the United States was involved in fighting down in America? <laughs> well, yeah, he was special yeah. forces. So, yeah, yeah, okay. So it was, uh, you know, the FARC insurgents were trying to overthrow... What was it, Columbia? Mike? He was an. He was. He, uh, there's there's some things we got to keep, but yeah, gotcha. he, he was, he was yeah. Ecuador. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Tom, I, I'll reach out to you offline on on the whole. Yeah. Right, Roger that, oh. Roger that. Yeah, I yeah. in the Canadian military, I only know of one incident, and it wasn't even. Uh, they didn't even use the word. They just said we've got an intruder near, near the perimeter. And of course, uh, they they went out to look, and it was described as freaking bear that walked on two feet. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically that only came out of that. And if there was any follow up on it, I have no idea. Well, they were close enough to see the face with yeah. the little gooseneck flashlight, you know, the old yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, now, Tom's. I don't know if you're aware of the uh, Rogers Rangers. In the, in the Green Mountains of Vermont, uh, had something journaled in their exploits. I believe it was in 1759, mm -hmm. where they had to repel a group of bears that were throwing rocks at them with a mm -hmm. volley of shot. I've heard the story. Yeah, yep. Yep, yep. I've heard the story. So, uh, it wasn't us. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> we were the enemy then, so it wasn't us. <laughs> Have you well, had a good rock throwing incident? Have I had a rock throwing incident? Yep. Oh, um, I've exposed a bunch of hoax rock throwing incident, and I've had one possible true one on our own, an area that we like to go to, and this is getting to be 10 years now. Uh, guys I was with say something's throwing rocks because I mean, they notice these rocks falling all around us. And this area, they, they had just put a new road through because they were going to be logging it. 
and we were going up and down this freshly dug uh, uh, forest service road because it was all dirt and it was a great place to look for tracks. So we're going up and down it. And while we stopped on one of our breaks, all of a sudden a bunch of rocks came flying. And I still wonder to this day where, 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 where they came from because we never saw anything. And the only other human around was the guy at the gate at the beginning of the road who was supposed to keep people like us from going in there because they're afraid of people messing around with the equipment. But we got there when he was away or something. They didn't see us go in. So we asked him, we always went, what was this guy throwing rocks and stuff like that? We asked him, it was impossible because he would have had to been the greatest pitcher in history to throw the rocks down to the point of the road where we were. So it wasn't <laughs> Dutton was throwing rocks or someone that we didn't see. Tyler, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you can read the screen. More likely, except I think his aim would have probably been a little better. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what the screen said was Todd Stanwich. It was Todd Stanwich. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh -oh. one, of, one, one of the biggest, there was a guy here who was, what, got him by my wife, smoke detector. <laughs> the smoke detector. Tell me what, he's got to go, my wife, the smoke detector. Is, uh, I'm a timer. <laughs> and, well, I didn't set off a crack of toe here, did I? <laughs> <laughs> But one of the oh. uh, we had a guy here who was make, trying to make uh, rounds in the Bigfoot field named Randy Brisson in Golden Ears Park, who did a lot of hiking in that area, and, and he, he claimed the sighting. And there was one possible footprint incident he was involved with that uh, I think could be possibly authentic because he's not the one that found him. He was led to him by somebody else. Uh, but we caught him red-handed throwing rocks. We were down there. The bunch of people in the BFRO came up. And he was getting that much attention at the time. And we were doing a sort of a <laughs> kilometer hike. What? what, what, what? You better get your wife an air fryer. <laughs> <laughs> That's my audience. <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Randy Randy Brisson. Brisson. yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, I, I noticed right away, and I, I uh, David Hill, I said, stay back a bit, and for God's sake, don't let this guy get in behind the group. Because all the time, every time it happened, it always happened to be when he was off to the side or he was not in view. And uh, and rocks was a, was a very generous term. It was more like big pebbles. And, uh, and he did the same mistake so many people who hoax he sees make he couldn't stop himself he had to get that last one in and he happened to throw it behind his back when i was looking right at him and he winged it off a tree which i don't think he meant to hit <laughs> <laughs> and so that was that you know and uh, it was hooking the, the, the biggest problem with rock throwing is it's one of the easiest things to fake yeah. you know and but what that day when we were in that expedition in the Norris Creek region where somebody or something unknown or somebody unknown was throwing rocks in our generation and they were pretty and they were pretty healthy sized ones, judging by the way we could hear them coming down through the trees like yep. I have no idea. But we didn't see anything and we looked. You know, we looked, we tried. And at one point they were coming down one side of the road and then they were coming down the other side of the road and then they went back to the, the first side of the road. But we saw nothing cross the road. And none of my guys who were with me was doing this. They drew my attention to it. And we're all looking at each other the whole time when we heard the damn thing. So, yeah, so somebody or something was throwing rocks. And that's probably the only time I was involved in the rock throwing that incident that I cannot explain away. But I can't oh, say a Sasquatch did it because we didn't see anything. Timmy Boy is back, uh, by the way. He forgot about his Bluetooth headphones. Well, we're glad to have you back, Timmy. And by the way, over on Facebook, uh, since you're on YouTube, Bob Lemley sent you a message that better get your wife an air fryer. So, <laughs> um, so we got a few more questions popping up. But before we, we get into that, I have a question of my own. Is What do you think of Matilda? Who's Matilda? That is the Bigfoot uh, Adrian Erickson. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, you mean Kentucky? I, the, <laughs> was that Kentucky? Was it Kentucky? You mean, I don't know. You, you I, mean, thought, uh, I always uh, thought you, Randy Brisson was the one who came up with Matilda. Uh, Matilda. Yeah, I remember Matilda. Yeah, he was involved in the Erickson Project. Yeah, it's, a, it's a guy wearing a Chewbacca suit. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That memory, Arjun Erickson, he was up here, and he said 2011 yeah, is the year of the Sasquatch. I'm, I'm pretty but, sure yeah. that was. I'm pretty sure that was a Randy Brisson product. Randy Brisson was involved with him. He was Randy Brisson yeah. was showing him around. I tried to warn him about Randy Brisson, but he didn't listen to me. He didn't, uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't warn you about Janice either, did he? Because <laughs> there was there was a uh, he bought the property. I know. Well, no, he didn't. He he bought the Kentucky property, but he was paying Janice a stipend. I did not know. I heard he bought the property. No, he didn't buy. And, I, and later on, she tried to say they followed us to the new property. You want to buy that too? <laughs> no, no, that was the Kentucky property. Yeah. Okay. It was the Johnsons that said they, that the Bigfoot followed them to the new property, and they oh, tried to get okay. they tried to get somebody else. That another question is uh, they tried to get Biscardi to buy it. <laughs> yeah, it was the same folks that that had the Kentucky property, so the Bigfoot followed them. But <laughs> that being said, somebody asked in there, "Has you ever have you ever crossed paths with Mister Snapple himself, Mister <laughs> Scardy?" No, uh, he's another tech guy I tend to avoid. And usually, when the something I hear about something going on, and I hear he's involved, I got red flags right off the yep. bat. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, he was involved with the Georgia boys, and they're body in the front. Oh, absolutely. Stuff. And I, you know, I just, as soon as I heard he was involved, I thought, okay, this is horse shit. Yep. You know? Yep. <laughs> and, you know, I, I looked at the mask in the, in, in the fridge, and I said, you know, I recognize this. This is that a Halloween costume for that company in California. They do these high-grade Halloween costumes. They simply bought one of these costumes and stuffed it with guts. Yep. Of kind of and then that night, the, yep. the owner of the company was on... Um, Coast to coast with Warren <laughs> Coleman. And yep. Yeah, oh, they did have one coast to coast, huh? Okay. <laughs> oh, now you I missed that one. I missed that one. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, we, now we're getting another tough question from Quick Witty. Wasn't David Pilates part of the Erickson Project? No, he was part of the Ketchum uh, study. Yeah, the Ketchum study, yeah. Yeah, and what do you think about Mr. Pilates? Well, David Pilates was a key pusher of the MK Massacre of Bluff Creek theory. That's how we first started. That's how we first started getting known. Uh, Pilates was sending emails to John Green saying, you got to come clean and stuff like that. And Green was taken aback by all this. I I, I was a, a bit of a, a fan of Mr. Pilates at first because his first, com first book came out called Tribal Bigfoot. I thought, I'm impressed. He, he got, it took me 15 years to get this much eyewitness testimony to write a book. And he did it in three, sure. <laughs> you know. Then I thought, I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that everyone that was in that book got paid 80 bucks for their story <laughs> or yeah. something like that. I don't know if that's true or not. That's what I heard. I said, well, geez, there's a woman in Chapman, the Sasquatch Inch will tell you stories all night long if you just keep buying the beer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know? But he was he was involved in 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 the the original when the massacre and, and I and John and Bill Miller got together and we wrote that article debunking that whole thing, you know, yeah. and we, we caught Pilates saying, Oh, I never said you accused you of anything. John said, well, what about this email you sent to Al Hodgson saying, you know, Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're harboring a deep, dark secret. You know, yeah. he, he didn't know that we were friends with Al Hodgson. So anything he said to him, we heard about it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah the, uh, the only good thing is instead of admitting he was wrong, Pilates went dead quiet on the whole thing. He never mentioned it again. I still to this day have never heard him himself bring up the yep. massacre of Bluff Creek again. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. kind of a yeah. bad, bad topic to get onto if you're pro yeah. pro massacre. Um, of course, you know, they, the, the other guy, the how to hunt guy uh, actually alluded that Poppy short was murdered. Yeah, and, wanna, and that was a total travesty too. So I think Pilates uh, was how to hunt guys' uh, law enforcement friend. In the it United was, State. yeah, because yeah, they, yeah. they had uh, like a couple yeah. of weeks before he made that reference. They yeah. apparently were together at some bar somewhere. Yeah, I think and, it's probably maybe maybe even Pilates that got how to hunt to bring up that whole massacre crap again. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Ken Collins said that uh, he knows Dennis Fole, and Dennis Fole hated the Erickson Project. I don't know how true. I don't well, know if you know Dennis or. Well, the Erickson Project uh, was a was a a complete another thing that got blown way out of proportion, 
And I said at the time, I don't know if you remember hearing me say that, I said at the time, the only thing that's going to come out of this, and I said the same thing about the Ketchum study, is they're going to be guests on Coast to Coast Radio once or twice a year with George Norrie, and that's about it. Yep. You know, and I was right both times. You know, I knew it. And I, I and when everyone says, oh, we got this great footage, but they won't show it to you, or it's a big secret or yeah. something like that, you know when you eventually do see it, it's not going to turn out what they claim. And it did. And why they couldn't recognize a Chewbacca mask must up a little bit when they saw one. I'll never understand. But confirmation bias. Yeah. Confirmation. Yeah. Well, the whole Ketchum study was nothing but confirmation bias. They fit yeah. that DNA to fit their prescribed. Yeah. Um, yeah, and buying your own magazine, publishing your own stuff doesn't qualify no. as uh, you know uh, <laughs> yeah. confirmation. <laughs> and, and failing and failing to mention it. Yeah, <laughs> that you bought the to publication yeah. until the press says, "Hey, wait a minute." Um, Lockbeard says, "I think Peter Kane's account of being sexually abused by a she Sasquatch is more believable than a Sasquatch phone call." <laughs> So there is another question. Thomas, how did they come up with that massacre BS? Do you know exactly? I mean, I, I know exactly what happened, and I kind of blame myself a little bit for this because I'm partially at fault. Uh, MK, before the massacre stuff, was in rather high regard with us all because of the stabilization work he had done on the PG film in general, right? Now, what happened was we, we sent him, and I think it was uh, uh, Chris Murphy uh, through Rick Knoll, uh, we sent him a copy of uh, a lecture film that John Green had put together in the early 1970s. It's a film that John Green had made for public speaking purposes, because this is before computers and, you know, and you, nowadays we could just hook up the laptop and we can put anything we want on the screen. Back before those times, you showed movies, you showed slides, or, or those uh, old floppies that they used to put in the machine there. That's what you did. And he had this made for lecture purposes. And on this lecture film, you had the Parish and Gimlin footage, a bad copy of it. Yeah, and you had other films spliced in because he's talking about different aspects of the mystery. And you had you had a, a beautiful picture of the mountainside with this old couple in, in Vancouver Island somewhere. You had the lady at the museum showing the book wash mask in front of it, and it would talk about that. You had little bits of the second roll of film that Patterson shot that day of him holding the cast up. You got the Patterson footage, and you got it stopped. And none of this had ever been seen by the public before. And, of course, you had a lot of the Blue Creek Mountain footage during the Blue Creek Mountain investigation of August, September of 67 too, which was mostly the Hinden's film. Mm -hmm. And the, and they had, there was a lot of shots of the pilot, Key Kazara, in that footage, walking around with the shotguns looking at the tracks. Well, MK, this is what I think happened. MK got a look at that, and, and since he'd never seen any of that before, he thought he was looking at never before seeing parts of the Parish and Gimlin film not knowing that they were different films spliced onto this public speaking film that had the Patterson footage on it as well, right? And he thought the Blue Creek Mountain footage and stuff like that was never before seen and parts that were being kept secret from the Patterson Gimlin film itself. And he started seeing all this stuff in there, you know, the body parts and stuff, and then he came out with this massacre uh, because – he, and I don't like calling people a, a, a hoaxer, but when you alter images, and he did, stills from the Blue Creek Mountain footage, you know, to make the hands of the pilot look red, to make the, uh, the, 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 the water in the creek look red, you know, yeah. and saying it's blood. When you alter images to give a false impression of what people are looking at, that's hoaxing by any definition I know. Okay, and that's what he did, and we called him on it. You know, and, and at the time they were tr they were even saying that the pilot, a man named Keith Kazer, was Bob Titmus, and Bob Titmus yeah. was involved. And of course, Bob Titmus was a taxidermist, and they said he was skinning them there after they shot them all and stuff like that. So the basic premise was they all went down there, John Green, DeHinden, uh, and, and Moffat, and all were all professional Canadian killers who were uh, down there. To wipe out this family of Sasquatch and cover the whole things up for the American government for some reason. 
and and Pilates fell for this. Bobby Short fell for this. Bobby was telling us, my unnamed experts say that's Bob Titmus in that footage. And I said, well, who are your unnamed experts? Pilates and MK? You know, it's not. Yeah. It's it's Keith Kazara. He's still alive. He lives, or at least he was then, back in 2010. He lives in Lethbridge, Alberta. We published all that. We published his flight log. We did everything to prove that uh, it wasn't even Timmons they were looking at. They just didn't want to hear it. Because yeah. it went against the narrator. And that's how it all came about. It's partially our fault because we wanted to get MK's opinion on certain aspects of the Blue Creek Mountain and, and the Patterson Gimlin film because we were working on the book Meet the Sasquatch at the time. Yeah. yeah. So we got uh, a bunch of questions uh, in, in the chat. So I'm going to, I got to scroll up a little bit. First, there was a question Does anybody uh, know what happened to D DOS's channel? I've heard nothing about him, in the, but the whole channel has gone well. D DOS currently is incarcerated in a Texas prison for uh, uh, domestic violence charges, and he will not be eligible for parole towards the end of this year, I believe. So that's what happened to him. He was also he was also involved in that guy's show from Florida. Um, oh, his name's got on my head. I was a guest a couple of times. Oh. Audio only. Um, oh. oh, it's got on my head. Yeah, but DDoS was usually on there quite a bit. Yep. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, not going to get out till sometime close to twenty twenty two, and that's if only and only if he uh, gets paroled by then. He may. Mm. His sentence ends, I think, the end of 22, end in 2022, if I'm not correct. I, can, I can't I can pull it. Well, actually, I don't have the share screen up, so I can pull it up and tell you the exact. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, I'm sorry, he's, uh, the parole eligibility is uh, expected in October of 2021. But he, uh, he had gotten sentenced to... Um, it doesn't really say, uh, so he, he will be, he could stay in there as uh, long as November of 2022, but at least on parole through then. So once he gets out, so that's unfortunate. Uh, but sometimes you reap what you sow, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and it wasn't his first run in either. So, um, uh, and I like D I did, um, Unfortunately, uh, you know, people have demons. So, uh, okay, so let's get back on the topic of the Bigfoot. Um, uh, hello to Bob Hip, my good friend Bob Hip, a longtime friend, popped in, said hello. Um, so we have eight minutes left to show. So we're going to go through some of these questions as quick as possible. Um People ask uh, where Bobby came into play. Well, Bobby was basically, uh, let me answer that one real quick. Bobby was basically starting to believe the story because, you know, David Pilates was leaning on her. Uh, you know, MK was leaning on her. And, you know, she was up there in years. You know, people think she was a young woman. She wasn't. She was uh, well into her 70s. Um, and then she passed away. And now Steve is also claims that there's a murder conspiracy uh, on that. Um so uh, there was something uh, saying uh, of, uh, okay, two more questions we got. So uh, first thing is uh, also um, uh, Eric Waltman says hello. Hello. Uh, <laughs> he says, uh, hello. Yeah, I haven't heard from you in a bit. <laughs> um, but uh, let's see. First, uh, the first question was, can you tell us something about Bill Miller? Bill Miller was an American from Illinois. He used to come up here all the time to do research. He was a good friend and a colleague, and he passed away October 1st. Oh. He, uh, when he wasn't in, involved in, in the Sasquatch field, he was well known in the Kennedy assassination crowd because, man, that man could tell you everybody that was in that Zapruder film, what he was doing, whatever it was, and what it was, and what happened to them later on in life. I mean, he knew everything about it. Yeah. I mean, he was a, an absolute giant. When as a younger man, he was an absolute friend of uh, uh, absolute fan of President Kennedy. Thought he was the greatest thing sliced bread. And when Kennedy was assassinated, I think it really, really hurt him, and uh, like it hurt so many others. And yeah. he he wanted to get the bomb because he never ever bought the uh, the official explanation yeah. for the Kennedy assassination. And Bill's greatest. Um, 
contribution to the Bigfoot field, in my opinion, was uh, when we put together, all worked together to put together that article, blowing up, blowing that massacre theory out of the water. And he actually visited uh, um, the uh, Ford Motion Picture Lab in Seattle because he was doing something for the Kennedy assassination thing. He wanted to buy some old uh, Kodak 8 millimeter, and he just happened to talk to somebody, and somehow the, t uh, the subject of Bigfoot came up and said, oh, yeah, we developed that here. We showed it right on that wall right over there. <laughs> and, oh, well, great. Who was that? What well, was a businessman the first year? Al Atley. He put it, and then about a, uh, six or seven months later, a little cowboy showed up to have copies made. Roger Patterson. So I can tell you right now, the uh, for you know, all those questions of where was the film developed? It was uh, developed the Four Motion Picture Lab at three hundred six Fairview Avenue, North Seattle, Washington. And I'll give you the go. phone number two. Well, there you go. <laughs> so Bill Bill was great, and he was strict as zoological, common sense, and uh, and uh, I miss him a lot. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, that's not really Yeah, well, it, it, I miss John Green a lot. I miss Rennie a lot. I miss Robert a lot. I miss Grover a lot. I miss John Benanay a lot, but, you know, we all get old and it comes to an end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question we're going to hit. Um, and uh, if we have time, we'll get to Ken's question. The uh, What do you think of Justin Smeha's story? Uh, the guy who claims to have shot one. The well, I think. Kills. I think. I, I, I think it uh, has been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was a. If there was anything shot, it was a bear. Yep. Yeah, agree. and I go along with what what, what the invest the follow up investigation came. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Ken Collins's question: uh, What do you think of uh, Daniel Perez's breakdown on Patty? I think Daniel Perez has done a lot of work down there. I was down there with him myself in two thousand and three. His breakdown, I, well, well, has he come to a different conclusion than his original one? No, I don't think so. I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think he's, he's pr probably pretty well bang on the money. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was wrong where the film location was for, for a while. Yeah. yeah. I I always knew knew where he was exactly it was. It was still there, but I think he was a little off. And I told him that. And I, matter of fact, in 2003, Daniel and I. There was a group going down there looking at the film set, and they're going the wrong way down the creek. Said, "No, no, follow us." <laughs> <Let's take it." laughs> and we did. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, Daniel's conclusions of uh, of uh, Patty, I think, is pretty bang on. Gotcha. Unless he's changed it. Uh, I know he's coming up with another publication soon on the whole subject. I don't know if he's changed it. I don't think so, yeah. uh, because I, I know he recently gave a lecture in Ohio. I and, didn't see it, so yeah. yeah. And nobody was was you know saying anything negative about it. And you know, oh, okay. if he had come out with a different result, people would have been yeah. saying, "Oh, I think you know." Yeah, you know, I, th I think I think he believes that it was an actual creature that day. Yeah. yeah, and I think he's bang on about the height estimates and stuff like that. He's probably right, but the, still, the biggest question is, what the hell lens did he have on that damn camera? Yeah. So we are at the end of the show, just about. Tom, you have any final words for anybody? Anything you want to throw out there? Any projects uh, you do? Well, the big, biggest part right now, I'm looking at uh, COVID's restricted my travel. I can't go in the United States. And now they're using COVID as an excuse to turn us into a show us your paper society. Yeah, We're not really allowed to travel outside our, our uh, medical zone. And there's been tracks found recently not too far away that I think is outside my medical zone. So I got a colleague looking into it for me. I won't wow. say anything about it till I know more about it. But it just happened uh, May 4th. Wow. And to people who want to get involved in this, go for it. But for God's sakes, 98% of what you see on YouTube and and the internet is well. It's a it's a soapbox for every snake oil salesman out there. Ninety percent of it's absolute garbage. Stick to the facts. Never deviate from the facts. Have a healthy dose of common sense. Nice. Yeah. Mike, anything final you want to ask Tom, uh, Tom before we go tonight? If is anybody taking one of those cameras to Lake Kodak to, to see what they might think it is? I mean, I, I'm in Rochester, which is the home of Kodak, and. Yeah, and we have the Eastman. The we have the uh, George Eastman House, which it has a lot of those old cameras and video equipment. So, 
Just wonder if anybody had reached out to them for that that equipment or that analysis. Well, again, it was in general because no one ever took down the serial number of the actual camera that Roger rented that day. It's even a, a long shot mathematical possibility that this might be it <laughs> because a buddy of mine picked this up for me in Washington State. But whatever, wow. well, whatever happened to the the exact camera, nobody knows. Even even uh, Shepherd's Camera Shop has no idea what eventually happened to it, whether it got thrown out or whatever. But no one ever took so, he, and they didn't really did no record of what what lens they had on the damn thing. Oh. So that's all they can tell you about it. So here's a little bit of insight I may have. I but, wonder. But one thing though, it's like I told you earlier. They're the ones that told me that this type of camera was actually, they stopped producing it in 1964. So you know, but there were still a lot of them around in 67, yeah. Thomas, I'm wondering if if that complaint paperwork, because usually that paperwork floats around forever. You'd think. If that complaint paperwork actually has the camera serial number on it. I don't know. No one's ever checked on that. There we go. It, there's, it, there's a I, I went down there and I asked for paperwork. They said, oh, God. I mean, most of the old camera stuff is went with the old cameras. No, no, I'm talking about I'm talking about <laughs> the police, the police agency, the police paperwork. Oh, could be. I don't know. I wonder if we, which which police which police force was it? Was it the Akama Sheriff Department? Was it the state troopers? Who who who, who well, would, arrested would, Roger it, Patterson? It would be, it would be yeah. in the court paperwork where he actually uh, had the charge. I wonder. Because that they would have had the cost of the camera to put the charge in there. Right. So they would yeah. have the actual camera lens and the camera. Mm -hmm. Or if there's any additional equipment. Or any additional equipment. Yeah. yeah. They still don't know if Roger, if uh, it, Bob doesn't think so, but some people think that there used to be a wooden handle, holding handle for the bottom of these things. So you can see the hole for it yep. right there. But uh, according to. Uh, Bob Roger never had a handle on the camera. He was holding it like this. Yeah. Yeah. And if you ever look through the lens of this thing, it's terrible. It's like looking through a pair of binoculars backwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. It was Bob Gibbon that had a good look at the damn thing that day, not Roger. Yeah. Well, again, Thomas, I I'm so glad you came on. It's always a treat to have you on. Well, at least you don't have to hold a phone over though. Yeah, like, I don't have to hold the phone. I'm <laughs> I'm not doing this tonight. What do you think, Tom? <laughs> uh, um, so that's awesome. Thank you, Mike, for for sitting in for Chris. Thank you both for letting me be out here and make sure you guys hit that like and share button. I'll, yep. I'll do that for Chris tonight. <laughs> and great job, Mike. Keep searching, man. I'm glad you took a little time out for the show tonight, but appreciate you out there in the snow trying to find the evidence, man. That's what we be should safe, be brother. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and we'll see you next week or this week, this upcoming weekend at the uh, Sasquatch Triangle Bigfoot Conference in Ohio, Coshocton, Ohio. So uh, who knows? We may get to tootle around in Salt Fork State Park for a little bit. Sounds like a plan. All right. So, folks, on behalf of everybody here, I uh, just want to let everybody know in two weeks, we will be returning with Leon Smith from Bigfoot. I'm sorry, Leon from Bigfoot Okanagan and Steve Anderson from Curious Cryptid, who is actually in chat tonight. So there he is. Um, and, and these guys are brains. And, Tom, you know both of them as well. <laughs> and, uh, boy, you guys are going to be in for a mind trip. <laughs> mind trip. But it's going to be a great show. That will be, we'll be returning here in two weeks, which that means that should be... 16, 23rd, I believe. That would be May 23rd, 2021, for episode 65. Again, we're going to have Steve, the Curious Cryptid, and Leon, Bigfoot Okanagan. And we'll have those guys on, of course, 9 p.m. Eastern here on youtube.com forward slash Steve Coles. So, on uh, behalf of everybody here, we want to wish everybody a happy, safe, and uh, healthy week. Um, we are almost out of this COVID stuff. So let's keep our prayers that it's going to pass quickly and, uh, we'll catch you. Of course, God bless. And of course, keep on squatching, catch you all here in a couple of weeks.
folks. You've been watching Squatch DTV. Join us each week, Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, for the latest on the Bigfoot mystery. As always, we thank you for being our loyal viewers and encourage all to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Steve Culls. As always, have a great week. Stay safe. God bless. And keep on squatching.